Good evening all, and welcome. Tonight, I have the pleasure of sharing the incredible talents of Raven Levine, with a tale that is sure to chill you to the bone. It's time to get comfortable and let the darkness take control. My mother costs $10,000. That's the standard price for a hit. My father was 25000 because he was considered an important person. At least, important enough to demand a formal investigation into his death. From what I've heard, the police never found anything besides the single razor blade used to cut each of their throats. Of course, I know who did it. I even saw it happen but I never had the chance to tell anyone before I was taken. No kids. That's Mr. Dakin's only rule as far as I can tell. The killer doesn't like to leave behind orphans either. So after my parents were dead, he took me with him. I remember being too afraid to even look him in the face. I just stared at the blood dripping from his black leather gloves while he talked, not hesitating to obey when he told me to get into his car. When you're not looking at the black gloves, Mr. Dakin doesn't seem like a killer. His face is warm and doughy with nothing but a mischievous twinkle in the eye to hint at what he's capable of. His voice is soft and low, a patient professor subtly guiding you toward discovery. A couple of the kids even like him, although they were the ones who were taken so young that they barely even remember the life Mr. Dakin stole from them. We don't see the assassin very often, Mostly, it's just his mother, who all the kids call Sammy D. She keeps the place clean and cooks for us. Not survival food, either. Real, home, cooked meals, with favorites that our own mothers used to make. Sammy D gives us all chores, too, but she works harder than anyone. She even splits the kids up by age and spends an hour a day with each group to homeschool us and assign reading. It's not nearly enough to forgive them but I haven't tried to run away either. I don't know where else I would go. And besides, the other kids were quick to tell me what would happen if I did. We've had two runners this year, Alexa told me the first night after steering me to my bed in the dormitory. She's a late teen, a few years older than me with tight blonde braids and sharp, humorless features. They're buried out back, next to Spangles, the cat we used to have. No kids? and no witnesses. I guess Mr. Dankin has two rules, and the second is more important than the first. Doesn't anyone try to fight back? I asked. I did. I almost got Sammy D too, a younger boy around 12 said from his adjacent bed. I had a kitchen knife and hid behind the door. She knew you were there the whole time, another boy, probably the older brother considering they both sported the same mass of unruly brown hair. She just wanted to test you. It wasn't a test, the first insisted. If you'd grabbed her legs, we could have got her. Did you get punished? I asked. They looked at each other and shrugged. If it was Mr. Dankin, we would be dead. Sammy D just took the knife away, the younger brother admitted. And showed us a different grip, chimed in the other. Said we were wasting our body weight by slashing upward when we didn't have to. They both began to mime a controlled slashing motion in the air. That's Simon and Greg. Simon's the younger one, but they're both idiots, Alexa said. Don't listen to them. Fighting is only going to make it worse for you. The comfortable routine may have been enough to distract us during the day, but the nights were harder. The darkness would blur the unfamiliar room into ghastly shuddering specters. The heavy silence did nothing to distract each of us from reliving our private nightmares. And I grew accustomed to falling asleep listening to the muffled sobs of those who couldn't drown out the sound with their pillow. I almost wished we were treated worse, that we were beaten or forced to work to destroy this facade of a family that Sammy D tried to shove down our throats. I didn't want to wait so long that I became indoctrinated into complacency like the others, though so I knew I had to act. 
I tried rat poison the first time. I mixed it in the brownie batter to disguise the taste and warned all the other kids so they'd stay away from it. Sammy D figured it out somehow, though. She threw away the whole batch before Mr. Dakin even came home. All she said was, You better think hard about who your friends are before you try something like that again. Try something like that again. It wasn't a warning. It was an invitation. I didn't sleep much the next few nights. I found a vent which opened into the AC ducts, but Simon was the only one small enough to climb around. I kept watch for Sammy D while Simon explored until he found the place directly above the kitchen. There was a heavy iron light fixture that I thought we could drop on someone, but it was screwed into place so tight that Simon couldn't find a way to budge it. I think I heard a wild animal skittering around the crawl space last night, Sammy D said the next morning while laying out plates of scrambled eggs. Yeah, I guess, I said. No one looked up from their plates. I just hope he's smart enough not to be crawling around when my son is here, she added innocently. We're running out of space in the backyard. Nobody had anything to say to that. Not until that night when we all started arguing. That's mine. Give it back, Greg was saying. You're just going to get yourself killed. Alexa dodged away from Greg's lunges. Mind your own business. Alexa sighed and dropped a heavy object wrapped in wires on the floor, an electric screwdriver and an extension cord. Where'd you get that? I asked. Sammy D must have left it here, Greg said. Simon was already unrolling the cable to measure out how long it would stretch. If she knows, then Mr. Dinkin knows, Alexa snapped. It's just another test, and you're going to get killed if you try something. She never told Mr. Dankin about the rat poison, I said. Or if she did, he didn't do anything about it. Well, if she doesn't tell him, then I... Alexa caught herself mid-sentence. Simon and Greg were so busy with the drill that they didn't seem to notice. Alexa caught me staring, though, and she dragged me aside to whisper in my ear. I can't reason with them but I need you on my side. If we don't warn Mr. Dankin, then he's going to. Not if he's dead. You can't be serious about this. After everything they've done for us? Alexa coughed and looked away. She must have become aware that the brothers were staring. As she was pulling back, she muttered, He's going to know, and you're going to be sorry. This wasn't the first time someone tried to kill Mr. Dankin or his mother but they always seemed to know about it beforehand. It wasn't Sammy D who was telling him, though. If anything, she seemed to be helping us. It was Alexa. She was the one foiling the plans, and if any of us were ever going to get out of here, then we'd have to account for that. Alexa was standing in the driveway waiting for Mr. Dankin when he got home. I couldn't hear what she said to him, but I saw the smile wrinkle up his pudgy face like an old pumpkin. The glimmer of a razor blade appeared in his hand. I don't think any of us are going to get a second chance. Sammy D was waiting in the doorway. She helped him with his coat and tried to steer him toward his recliner in the living room, but he had only one thing in mind. He wordlessly stalked around the perimeter of the kitchen, carefully eyeing the iron light fixture from all angles. The whole while he paced, he kept playing with the razor in his hand, letting the light sparkle for everyone to see while it danced through his fingers. Where is Simon? He asked at last. No one replied, but I caught Alexa glance up at the ceiling. Mr. Dinkin must have noticed it too. His eyes twinkled. Don't bother coming out, Simon. The hunt is my favorite part, he called. Be careful, it's going to fall, Alexa said. Don't worry, we'll take the light down, Greg said, winking at Alexa's confusion. I helped Greg carry a chair in from the living room that he could stand on. What are you doing? When he catches Simon, Alexa hissed. Shh, I muttered. Greg was already climbing onto the chair. 
Mr. Dankin was still fixated on the light fixture, chuckling to himself. Now, I shouted, flinging myself at Mr. Dankin to pin his arms. Simon exploded from his concealment in one of the kitchen cupboards to latch on to the man's legs. Behind you, Alexis screamed, but it didn't matter anymore. Greg had already launched himself from the chair, using the extra elevation and his body weight to drive a knife deep into the man's back with vicious force. I latched on even tighter as the blood started flowing over me, our combined weight forcing the man to the ground. For a second, his hand holding the razor blade broke free, but it twisted into a feeble claw as the thrusting knife drained the last of his strength. It only took a few seconds before the rest of the children joined in, stomping, kicking, scratching, biting, all piling on top of the man who killed their parents, tearing him to pieces like a hundred years of decay condensed into a second. What about Sammy D? Alexa was screaming. Who do you think gave him the knife? Sammy D asked, leaning in the doorway. But he's your son! Alexa wailed. He's my assassin, she corrected. Mr. Dankin wasn't moving anymore. One by one, the kids pulled themselves off the body, some giving a few more swift kicks as they parted. But I only lost one assassin, Sammy D said. And look how many new ones I have now. We were all frozen in place, trying to read all the other blank faces in the room. Sammy D fished inside her purse and pulled out several large wads of cash wrapped neatly in rubber bands. Twenty thousand dollars, because he was dangerous. That was your first job, she said. You have a family here, after all. A home. A way to make money and even help people if you choose the right targets. The first one is the hardest, but after that it's just practice. I want all of you to clean this mess up and wash up before dinner. Training begins for real tomorrow. She left the cash on the ground, but none of us followed her. The thrill of the kill was still hot in our blood. Could I do it again? Almost definitely. From this day on, I was a killer no matter what else I did besides. No kids, though. You've got to draw the line somewhere. Sammy D taught us that there are three distinct ways to kill someone. The first is a murder of opportunity. The victim is alone on a dark night, or is blackout drunk, or some other circumstantial convenience which makes it the right time to act. Then, there is the assassination, the calculated and premeditated kill which we will be training for. Finally, there is the murder of passion, when the blood boils too hot and we allow rage or hatred to force our hand. This is the most risky way to kill someone, both physically in the moment and regarding future forensic investigations, and it is strictly forbidden to us. I don't think there exists a term to describe exactly how Mr. Dankin died. The premeditation was inherent, as was the opportunity of his distraction, but neither compares with the utter brutality of his execution. I noticed when we were burying the body that the knife wounds in his back were surprisingly superficial. I think it was the shock, more than anything, which toppled him over. The actual cause of death? the lacerations of a dozen children skinning him alive with fists, nails, teeth, kitchen utensils, and anything else we could get our hands on. And of all of us who shredded him like a pack of wild dogs, none did so with more ferociousness, more glee, or more hunger than a small boy named Maker. I'd barely even noticed Maker during my first few days at the house. He was only ten years old, seeming even younger because of his diminutive, almost emaciated frame. He never spoke without prompting, and his rare answers would be muttered with the volume and assurance of a self-conscious mouse. I hadn't counted on his help during the actual killing, but the moment Mr. Dakin had dropped to the ground, Maker had transformed into something new altogether. Even long after the man was dead, 
It took three of us to pry open the maker's jaw from around the assassin's throat and drag the boy into the living room so he wouldn't disturb the burial. Hope I'm not paired up with that little demon, Greg had said during our first physical training session. I swear, he just licked his lips when Sammy D was talking about safe words. Shut up. You have no idea what he must have gone through to act like that, Alexa scolded him. What are you even doing here? Greg shot back. I figured you'd be ratting us all out to the police by now. I nudged Greg hard. Sammy D was waiting for us to be quiet with her arms crossed. She may look like a babushka with her short gray hair tied back in a handkerchief, but she made disarming and pinning someone look like a ballet. Sammy D let the silence drag out for a few more excruciating seconds before she turned back to the chalkboard with its grotesquely detailed drawing of the human anatomy. Trust me, if I had somewhere else to go, I'd be there. Alexa couldn't resist whispering back. Bullshit, Greg mumbled. Weren't your parents hotshot musicians or something? You're probably loaded. Alexa didn't need to answer. The angle of her glare from under her brow spoke volumes. Greg and Simon. Sammy D barked. You're up first. Let's see those stances. We didn't get to the actual combat training until after dinner. Sammy D says that if your victim is fighting back, then you've already failed. Her teachings focused more on concealment, tracking, the preparation of poisons, and accuracy with projectiles. As long as she was teaching the theoretical stuff, it just felt like the coolest class I've ever taken in my life. The illusion couldn't last, though. Once the fighting started, it was impossible to ignore the deadly purpose that we were approaching every day. I was paired off against Maker. I asked to switch, since he's over five years younger than me, but Sammy D just said, the most difficult blows to strike are against those weaker than us. I think she was just placating my ego though, because there was nothing weak about going up against Maker. How am I supposed to hit him? He's not even in the right stance, I protested. Then teach him why he's wrong, she said. But what if he goes psycho and makes up all his own stuff? Then he'll teach you why you're wrong. Maker didn't exactly jump at me. Jumping would imply pushing off from something, and I'm not positive his feet never touched the ground. Before I knew what was happening, he was crawling all over me, raking my face with his fingers, grabbing my hair, digging his knee into my back. I don't understand how Sammy D thought this was okay. She talked a big game about calculating approaches and precise controlled motions, but she just stared and smiled while that wild thing pummeled me from all sides. The safe word? Completely ignored. One of his nails dug a deep trench above my eye and I couldn't see a thing through the blood. I tried just protecting my face with my arms, but he was relentless. He had lots of openings, but I couldn't let my guard down for a moment without getting absolutely savaged. When I'd finally had enough, I just ran through the hail of blows to tackle him to the ground. I straddled him with my superior body weight and pinned him tight, and that should have been the end of it. This is your chance to teach him, Sammy D shouted. I give, I give, Maker wailed, struggling feverishly against my grip. I started to stand but powerful hands clamped onto my shoulders and pushed me back down on top of the boy. He's not going to learn like that. Hurt him bad. What? I'm not going to... The vice of Sammy D's hands closed. You let him just walk away from this, and he's going to think it's okay to lose. That's not how this game is played. You lose once in the real world, and you're dead. Now make him feel it. The blood was flowing freely into my eyes and the whole world had gone red. My face was on fire from a dozen scratches that greedily drank in the blood. D, 
Do it now, Sammy D shouted in my ear. Maker clenched his eyes shut underneath me, his face tormented into a mask of sheer terror. I wanted to slam my fist into the little bastard's mouth so hard that all those sharp teeth rained down his throat. I wanted to hurt him so bad my whole body was an ocean of pressure begging release. Maker wasn't a criminal mastermind or a killer though. He was a frightened little boy who only knew one way to survive. And overflowing with how badly I wanted to hurt him just because I could, that scared the shit out of me. I slapped Sammy D's hands away and scrambled off of Maker. Everyone in the yard was staring at me. I turned a slow circle, then looked down at the boy on the ground. His eyes were still shut and he was trembling all over. I don't know how much of the blood was mine and how much was his. Then, at Sammy D, her hands and her hips scowling at me like she'd just caught me breaking a promise to her. This isn't who I am. This isn't who any of these kids are. But it's what they'll become if they stay. I turned and ran, half expecting a bullet or a tripwire or something to spin me to the ground before I'd taken a dozen steps. Not a word or sound behind me, not even the footfalls of a pursuer. I was free. I waited about ten minutes to catch my breath and let my head clear. Then I circled around to the front of the house. I heard the shouts from the other people still in the yard, so I guess the rest of them were still training. I slipped up to the dormitory to take my share of the $20,000 I had stuffed under my mattress. That's all I needed to start a new life. I sure as hell didn't need this. She gave us our first mission. I practically jumped out of my skin at the voice. It was Alexa, sitting on her bed in the dark. I ignored her and moved to retrieve my money. Maker took it. He volunteered. Alexa added. You can just leave with me, I said. Alexa shook her head. I volunteered too. Why? Because Maker's staying, and I have to keep my little brother safe. That little monster is, I know how he gets when there's a fight. I kept trying to avoid fights with Mr. Dankin because I knew Maker would go crazy and get himself killed, but I promise it's not his fault. He's only like that because, I don't care, I shouted. I had my money and wasn't going to waste any more time here. I'm never coming back, and I'm never going to see any of you again. Yes, you will, she called after me. Our first mission is you. You haven't felt alive before you've killed someone. The symphony in your nerves in that moment will drown out every thrill you've ever had. I've never seen a color brighter than Mr. Dankin's blood, nor heard a sound truer than the death rattle rasping from his final breath. And if I go the rest of my life wading through a sea of muted colors, I will accept it gracefully because I know I have tasted of the forbidden fruit and hate myself for how sweet the juices ran. I didn't waste time plotting counterattacks or defensive measures. I stashed my money in a shallow hole and ran the whole four miles to the nearest police station. The blood had stopped running from the gash above my eye, but no one needed to look twice at me to know I've been through hell. We're going to send a squad car with two officers to investigate the premises, the man in the station told me. Do you feel comfortable going with them to show where the bodies are buried? Of course I wasn't comfortable, but neither would I be okay sitting at the station and letting two men go unprepared into that den of evil. Two won't be enough, I said. You'll be walking into a war. We have no intentions on fighting anyone. We're just going to take a look around and we can always call for a backup if anything doesn't feel right, Sergeant Sinclair said. He had enough gray hair around his temples to know better, but he talked with a rigid arrogance that left no room for debate. 
Sinclair and Deputy Erickson escorted me to their cruiser and told me to sit in the back and I allowed them to take charge. One way or another, this would all be over soon. I hadn't wanted to sabotage my own credibility by telling them the assassins were children. I'd only said that I knew who killed my parents, knew where the orders were coming from, and knew where at least three bodies were buried. I didn't work up the courage to tell them more until we were already parked outside Sammy D's house. She brainwashes people. I splurted without context. She kidnaps children and she brainwashes them to fight for her. You can't let your guard down. Not for a second. Not with anyone. Stay in the car until we come back. You'll be perfectly safe, Sergeant Sinclair said. I nodded rigidly. My face pressed against the window, straining to get a glimpse of what might be in store for them. Maybe Sammy D just took her money and ran for it. She must have some contingency plan in case she was discovered, right? She couldn't intend to take on the whole town. The officers were about a dozen feet from the park cruiser when Maker appeared around the side of the house. He was limping in an exaggerated motion, his face and body further smeared with blood and bits of gore. He was crying and wailing for help. But the moment the police started advancing, Maker turned and began staggering in the opposite direction. It was so real, it made me sick. At least until Maker skipped a step, accidentally limping on the wrong leg. But I don't think either of the cops noticed. Don't follow him, it's a trap, I shouted through the glass. Stay in the car. Sinclair barked without turning. Erickson had already disappeared around the corner after Maker. Then came a shrill scream from the yard on the other side of the house, and a moment later, Sinclair was gone too. Just me, pressed against the glass and wondering if it was already too late to run again. Then another face, an inch from mine, peering through the window at me. Alexa knocked sharply and said, Hey, can you hear me? She must have been kneeling beside the car because her body was obscured behind the door. I couldn't tell if she was carrying a weapon. I triple checked that all the doors were locked before I replied. It's over, Alexa. Turn yourself in or run. You don't need to go down with these people. You still don't understand, do you? She asked. The sincerity in her voice and the pleading furrows in her smooth skin were disarming. Sammy D is going to take care of us forever. She loves us. Like she loved her own son. There was a gunshot from the yard. I jolted so bad that I hit my head on the ceiling. Alexa didn't even react. Like everything was so perfect before, Alexa said, her voice still gentle and coaxing. Do you know what would have happened to Maker if Sammy D hadn't saved him? Saved? I couldn't believe my ears. Why was there only one gunshot? What the hell was going on over there? We'd go weeks at a time without even seeing our parents, she continued. Sometimes they'd remember to hire someone to take care of us. Sometimes it was just me and Maker. Even when they were home, we weren't allowed to leave our room when they were partying out there. And with the meth, that could go on sometimes for days at a time. A second gunshot, a third immediately afterward. That wasn't a warning, that was an execution. Do you have any idea what it's like to hold your little brother and wait for him to stop shaking? Only he wouldn't stop because of the chemicals going through his veins. But I couldn't understand that. I thought he was just scared, and that it was my fault I couldn't get him to feel safe. Two more gunshots in rapid succession. I could imagine Sammy D kicking over the second officer's slumped corpse so clearly that I might as well be staring at it. Maybe it wasn't like that for you, but someone must have wanted your parents dead for a reason. Ever think about what they were hiding that made this happen? Ever wonder if they deserved it? Everyone out there deserves to die. Everyone but us. Sammy D wants to give you another chance to join the family. 
I couldn't stand it any longer. I had to see what was going on. If the police were dead, then staying here wouldn't protect me anyway. Alexa stepped back as I slowly opened the door. It was impossible not to notice the razor blade clutched between her fingers. What's it going to be? Sammy D was walking around the house, a handgun casually hanging from her fingers. That was it then. It was over. Alexa grinned, moving to stand in solidarity beside the old woman. We're leaving here within the hour, Sammy D added. You're coming with us, or you're staying here? Doesn't matter to me, either way. Sammy D's finger twitched around the trigger. She might pretend to be relaxed, but I could see the tension which twisted her fingers into a claw around the gun. I didn't have any delusion that staying here meant anything other than buried in the backyard. What's the matter? Her voice was a gravel avalanche. Too scared to answer? I shook my head. You taught me better than that. Half a smirk played about her lips before they drew back into a tight line. Alexa was still smiling. You taught us all better than that. Except for Maker, right? You never seemed to care that he was out of control. Alexa's smile flirted with a snarl. I couldn't understand why, but I see it now, I said. You never thought he had what it took to become an assassin, did you? You never even bothered to show him how to defend himself, because you only ever planned on using him once. The front door opened, and I could see the rest of the children huddled inside. They were laden down with duffel bags and suitcases, ready to go wherever they were told. You're better than that, though. Sammy D said. I'm not going to throw you away. I'm going to take care of you. Alexa's eyes flashed across the children. She ran back to peer around the side of the house. I could practically see the gears in her head turning beneath the frantic lashing of her braided hair. Two gunshots for each of the two cops. Where did the first shot go? Sammy D. No, Alexa started, her words dying in her mouth. Your brother was a hero, Alexa, Sammy D. cooed. We all owe our lives to him. I caught the eye of Greg and Simon inside the house. I didn't miss the curt nod. I didn't underestimate the light burning in Alexa's eyes. None of us needed so much as a word to know what had to happen next. Sammy D. felt it too. Her gun was leveled in a flash. One bullet escaped the muzzle but I was already behind the armored door of the police cruiser. She never got a second chance. Children were pouring out of the house, leaping on the old woman and dragging her to the ground. The flash as Alexa's razor traced a line in the air like a spear of light. It wasn't the death rattle or the color of blood which filled the air though. There was no sound so haunting as the pitiful howl which ripped itself from somewhere deep inside of Alexa. There was no color, like the fire in her eyes being tempered by the rush of her swelling tears. The thrill of the kill was still hanging in the air, but one look around was enough to know that it was nothing compared to the burden of loss. We had money and a chance at a new life together. The most important thing we gained from the Assassin's Orphanage is knowing you can't buy yourself a new life at the price of someone else's. Life can't be bought or sold or stolen in any form. It can only be built. And it's a whole lot easier to build when you have a real family like I have now. I just want to give a huge thank you to Mortis Media for featuring me on his channel. I have been a fan for a very long time, as all of you are here today. I would like to thank each and every one of you that have taken time out of your schedule to listen to me in this video. I hope you've enjoyed what you've heard, and if you had, I would be honored if you'd stop by my channel and check me out. I do narrate various types of horror stories. I also have a separate playlist in which I explain certain elements of witchcraft everything from spells 
to breaking the myths of black magic and the left hand path. So if that's something you're interested in, you can find that there as well. If it's not, as I said, I do have playlists of just horror stories. Again, I want to thank all of you for having me and listening to me. I hope you enjoy the rest of your day or evening, depending on where you're at and what you're doing. I am Raven Lavina. Blessed be.